I'm Bob Makovic and welcome back to our second session of Caring for the Caregiver. Last time we talked about what is a caregiver and welcome to the club. Today we'll talk about what does a caregiver do? What are the expectations and the roles and the responsibilities of caregiving? Perhaps as we start, let me share with you some signs that whether you or a loved one may need a caregiver. Here are some clues. The person has become unsteady, maybe has an uneven gait, has difficulty getting up from a chair, perhaps they have fallen for an unknown reason. For the person, their personal hygiene has diminished. They may be forgot to take a bath, forgot to shave, eh, looking a little unkempt. Perhaps the person has a sudden change of weight, either positive or negative. Now that may be a sign of some other issues, even like depression. It may be a sign that they're having difficulty handling simple tasks like shopping or cooking. What does the refrigerator look like? Is the food spoiled? Have you smelled the carton of milk? How's the house or the yard? Maybe the favorite flower bed is no longer a flower bed, but a bed of weeds. Is the unusually clean house now dirty? Is there a change in personality? Is the one who was once verbal now become quiet and compliant or vice versa? Is the mail left unopened? Are bills left unpaid? Or is there suddenly in the mailbox a slew of new subscriptions or sweepstake entries? Is there a new best friend who's more than willing to help? Does the car have a new dent in it? Or is there a traffic violation? Or is it simply that you don't feel safe getting in the car with that person or letting your kids get it right at that car? Any of those may be signs for a caregiver. Caregivers can be spouses, partners, adult children, parents, other relatives, siblings, aunts or uncles, nieces, nephews, in-laws, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, whatever the relationship with the person you're caring for, it's important that you add the title caregiver to the list of things that you are. Without identifying yourself as the caregiver, you won't know to search for resources that can help you and may not have resources available to you. Caregivers play other roles as well. As a caregiver, you may be employed full-time or part-time. You may be raising your own children, or be a volunteer, have a spouse, have other family commitments. Adding caregiving to that list can lead to frustration and even exhaustion. As a caregiver, you might need to navigate social service systems, make doctor's appointments, even if you're working while you're at work. Advocate for the care receiver. Take care of their day-to-day -day needs while you try to do all the same things for yourself. 
and even for your family. And as a caregiver, you are rarely trained to do the broad range of tasks that you are asked to do. Here are some common things that caregivers are asked to do. You may have a list of your own. Buy groceries, cook, clean house, do laundry, provide transportation, help the caregiver get, the care receiver get dressed, even bathe or take a shower, take their medicine or help plan the routine for them to take their medicine. As a caregiver, you may need to help transfer someone out of a bed or a chair, perform medical interventions, treat wounds, help deal with legal issues. For example, is there a will? Is there someone who's been named the power of attorney? Are advanced directives in place? And if so, where are those documents kept? As I suggested, you may be asked to make medical appointments, drive to the doctor, and if allowed, notice if allowed, sit in during appointments. Talk with doctors, nurses, other care managers, and help so that you can understand what needs to be done. Handle finances and other legal matters. Perhaps most importantly, be a companion, friend, someone to walk alongside of. So what are the things that you do? Try making a list, both for your own clarification and even for other family members who may not be aware of all that's being done. It's easy to become overwhelmed as a caregiver. Here are some things that, some steps that maybe can help with not being so overwhelmed. First, identify yourself as a caregiver and have the care receiver identify you as such. Get a good diagnosis of what your loved one's health condition is so that you understand best how you can help them. Learn what specific skills you might need to care for someone with this particular diagnosis. Caring for someone with dementia, for example, is very different from caring for someone with chronic heart disease. If necessary, learn new skills needed to care for your loved one. Lifting a person in such a way so as not to do harm to yourself or to them. Lifting a person the wrong way is a wonderful way to ruin your back. As a caregiver, you may need to talk about finances and health care wishes with your care receiver. You may even need to talk about funeral desires and wishes. Now I know that those conversations are not easy and require wisdom, discernment, and maybe even a little bit of patience. You may need and want to raise the issue once just to plant a seed and come back to it to another time. As a caregiver, you may need to complete legal paperwork, as I suggested, powers of attorney, advanced directors, etc. You may need to bring family and significant friends together to discuss kind of a plan of care. If there's more than one family member, discuss who's responsible for what. And if possible, share the load. 
but also have, I would suggest, have clarity regarding who is the primary caregiver. It may be the primary caregiver who's allowed to have access to medical information and even talk to doctors and other professionals. Need to have clarity around that issue. Keep others up to date on the current situation. If you have others coming into the home, for example, keep a journal. Let folks write down who was there and when they were there and what happened. Identify resources, both personal and in the community. The caregiver, find support for yourself and your loved one. And remember, you are not alone. Caregiving is hard work and incredibly stressful, but it's also incredibly rewarding. It's been said some of life's most difficult challenges come with the biggest rewards. Caregiving is one of life's most difficult challenges. But what are the rewards of caregiving? Caregivers express that one of the rewards is that it enhances or even repairs personal relationships. You often experience quality, intimate time, maybe that you never thought you'd ever have with a loved one. Your role as a caregiver for a family member offers the opportunity to spend more time together. It can create moments for time to talk, increased intimacy and candor, perhaps even repair a relationship that, and deal with issues that may have been unresolved for years. It can help you redefine your relationship in meaningful ways. Caregivers say that one of their reward, one of the rewards is a sense of personal satisfaction. That even as their loved one passes away, they have few regrets and realize that they do or have done the best they could. Many of us feel good about ourselves when, when we believe we have made a difference in the lives of those that we care about. Caregiving, by definition, offers the opportunity to offer physical and emotional support to a loved one needing help. Your role as an advocate can impact the quality of life for a loved one and can help ensure that they get the proper level of care and support. It can be personally affirming when you feel that you have helped someone who has helped you in the past. Caregivers talk about one of the rewards is the opportunity for self-reflection and growth. When folks become keenly aware of what's essential in life and develop a sense of gratitude, even a sense of blessing, develop a sense of kindness and compassion that perhaps was never known before. The process of caring for someone who may be in, incapacitated in some way or, or dying and needs help can cause the caregiver to reflect on his or her own beliefs about many things. This may include questions regarding what or who brings quality and meaning to your life. What are your beliefs about death and what happens when you die? It can result in a, a re-examination 
of what you truly value in your life and if anything that you want to do in terms of changing things in your own life. Finally, caregivers, caregiving <clears throat> causes many folks to ask themselves what they would like to do with their remaining days. Some people surprise themselves in terms of how they face their role of a caregiver, finding physical and emotional reserves that they never thought that they previously had. As I reflect on those last two, personal satisfaction and reflection of and self-reflection and growth, I'm reminded of the book of Mitch Album's book, Tuesdays with Maury. Caregivers talk about a sense of accomplishment. They have few regrets. More, many people report a feeling of self-accomplishment in their role as a caregiver. They feel good about being there in meaningful ways with their loved one. The direct involvement also helps them feel that they did all they possibly could for their loved one. And hence they do not express any regrets about the things they did not do when their loved one has passed away. There's a sense of accomplishment in terms of the daily creative aspects of caregiving that arise when you find that connection with a loved one and help them do something today that maybe they didn't do yesterday. Knowing that your efforts have brought a quality to life, even if it is only for a brief time, offers a strong sense of accomplishment and personal satisfaction. Caregivers talk about one of the rewards is the opportunity to connect with others, develop a broader perspective. The caregiver role can connect you with others in important and meaningful ways. Being part of a caregiving team, perhaps even just with siblings or other family members, can bring you closer together. Personal highlights with family members can result in time together, exchanging stories. There's great power in sharing stories. And we as a people of faith are a people of stories. And they're making connections, supporting one another and your loved one. We should never underestimate the importance of making such connections. And it can occur person to person, in support groups, and there are a ton of support groups out there, even online in chat rooms or other caregiving websites. The resource sheet that I have provided has suggestion of websites. Bonding with someone who understands what you are going through because they have been there creates a powerful connection. Their support, born of the shared experience, can help strengthen you when you are feeling times of doubt, isolation, or loneliness. One of the resources that has become important to me over the past several years is book, A Guide for Caregivers by Benjamin Pratt. Ben actually was one of my clinical supervisors. In the back of the book you write, in one out of three American households, someone is a caregiver. Women and men who give body, mind, and soul 
to care for the well-being of others. These millions need help. More than financial and medical assistance, they need daily practical help in reviving their spirits and avoiding burnout. We'll talk about avoiding burnout or trying to manage that in the next session. But who are these folks? They're folks who have lived, lived this tough life, perhaps even graduated from the School of Hard Knocks, and felt the agonies and the joy, even the boredom. And yet they've extended compassion with a gentle word or a tender touch. Ben writes in his book, Caregivers live a dangerous life of love. Love is always risky. But this deep form of love lived out by caregivers is dangerous. If you love like this, your heart will be broken. If you love like this, you will also have the greatest hope for healing and wholeness. Rabbi Harold Kushner once wrote, Caring about others, running the risk of feeling, and leaving an impact on others brings happiness. Next week we'll talk about more the stress of caregiving, the potential for burnout, and even caring for yourself as a caregiver. And as we did last time, I'd like to conclude this time with a reading from Joan Gunzelman's book, 124 Prayers for Caregivers. She starts this devotional with reading from the prophet Isaiah. From Isaiah 6, I heard the voice of God saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, answered, here I am, send me. And then she writes, not everyone is willing or able to reach out with care to others. Not everyone can manage the hard work or the necessary learning and skills. Some people, quite frankly, simply say no. When we caregivers look past the difficulties of the job and the weariness it can sometimes bring, we recognize our deep desire to be of service and to help others. We begin to acknowledge that we stand on holy ground and we know what we do is more than simply a job. Would you join with me in prayer? O caring God in whose hands I rest, I am ever so grateful for the privilege that I may have in my caregiving. I am glad that you sent me. Give me opportunities to care for others. Even when I am overwhelmed, I know that I that what I am doing, I do for you. May I always be aware that you have sent me to care for those whom I care. I pray for caregivers and those that are care receivers. Wrap your arm of love around them all. Amen.